first, and then we'll open it up for discussion. All right. Um, I'll be brief, because I think some of the things I can say will come up in our discussions. But um, my name is Henri Williams. I'm the director of the Housing Bureau at Oasis. Um, we all had different pathways to this. And as I'm listening to my colleagues here, so I came to harm reduction a very different way. Um, I was a program director for an adolescent program. And if any of you work with adolescents, it's a whole different situation. And this idea of people, I'm sorry? Oh, oh that's the phone. <laughs> and you know, this whole idea of an adolescent coming into a program, needing treatment, and going from use to I'm all, I got it and I'm abstinent just did not work. And we were seeing a lot of failures. And, this just wasn't working. Something needed to change. And I was introduced to a gentleman, Alan Marlott, who wrote a book, Relapse Prevention, in the early 90s. And from there, I joined the Harm Reduction Coalition in Lower Manhattan. And that was the beginning of my change. Um, and what was so important for me is harm reduction was not simply, oh, just let them do what they want. You know, and I think that gets lost. You know, a lot of people see harm reduction as people just coming and going, drinking, doing their own thing, and there's no checks and balances. And one of the things that was so important, I think, for me and the Harm Reduction Coalition is it is not that. It is about, it's a process. It's about engaging people. It's about finding ways to motivate people, meeting them where they're at, and moving along a continuum towards some behavior change. So we introduced that into our adolescent program and saw much better success. And the success, I mean, just think about this. In your typical program, people tend to react to things that don't go well. Oh, you relapsed. Let's talk about that. Oh, this didn't work out in the home visit. Let's have a confrontation about that. In our model, in this harm reduction model, we flipped the script. We wanted to, let's celebrate the things that are going well. So let's say you went on a home visit and you typically used every day, but this time you only used twice. Let's not talk about the other thing. Let's talk about the two days that you managed to I mean, the five days that you managed to not use, what did you do? How were you effectively able to accomplish that? Versus let's focus on and have a confrontation about the two days that this didn't work. And I think when you start to shift that thinking, you are actually working with people around their successes and building on successes rather than continuing to bring them back down. So how does this move into the current issue of housing first? To me, it's a no-brainer. You know, harm reduction is housing first. Um, putting people in homes is reducing harm. We know what happens if you're on the street when you're homeless. Some of you may not like this. Homelessness sucks. I mean, there's nothing good about being homeless on the street. Um, I think this MRT initiative that has come about is one of the most wonderful things that could have happened. Um, I have a background in public health also, and when I think about this in the big picture, I think the MRT has really brought around opportunities that we just haven't seen before. Um, one of the earliest speakers talked about health. And health, to me, is so much a part of this. So what the MRT program is allowing us to do is to take this chronically homeless person and connect them with a health home. Um, we are now working on finalizing the waivers where we're going to be bringing in the health and recovery planning, which is the behavioral health services that will be coupled to this. Um, but what we have also done, which is such a wonderful thing, if any of you know about stages of change and that kind of model, uh, Oasis has been in the housing business for a little over 20 years. We have 1,900 units of housing, 900 units of shelter plus care. We have um, somewhere around 400 in New York, New York. We have permanent upstate. We have reentry. 
But every one of those programs, if you think about the stages of change, meant you had to be in the maintenance stage. You had to be in those last phases. And what does that do? That left a huge population of homeless people out in the cold, do mind, if you don't mind my pun. And so what the MRT program is doing is, if we look at that stage of change, we're taking pre-contemplators, we're taking contemplators, we're taking people in the action stage. And who's to say that once I am anchored and stabilized in my housing, and things are now being supported and resources are given to me, I can't achieve that same outcome as other people. And why does that have to be seen as a reward? You know, why can't that just be the compassionate, right thing to do because we care about each other? Um, but I think it is also bringing in a lot of challenges. And as I said, you know, we've been in the housing business for a long time. When we released our MRT awards, um, all of the awards went to, let's say, housing providers who have already been in our system. So I mentioned that to suggest they have a mindset. So the mindset is I'm getting someone who's coming out of treatment, they're motivated, they're going to self-help, you know, they're not using. We have all these rules, if you relapse, these things start to happen. Oh, sorry. All these things start to happen, and all of a sudden we're saying, no, you can't do that anymore. Um, and that is really challenging people in a lot of ways. Um, the idea of abstinence versus harm reduction. The idea that when you are um, going through the application process for someone, and I, I also want to go back, I think one of the key things in implementing this is the implementation plan. You just don't say, we are now going to do housing first and start bringing in tenants. You know? I think there's a lot of value to orientation, to education, to helping your staff to reframe their thinking. And as an example of this, I was just going to mention, we in our implementation plan have had very frequent ongoing, what I call learning collaborators with our providers. These collaborators are opportunities to not just get a sense of how are you doing, you know, implementing the program, but what are the things, what are the challenges you're experiencing? And how do you, with each other sharing those challenges, figure out what are you going to do? Some of those challenges are people are actively using in the units. You know, you have folks who, who are still drinking, who may still be using certain drugs. Um, you may have folks who, in that moment, don't seem motivated to do anything different at that time. However, in this construct, as long as they are not, let's say, being untoward, they, they have a right to be there, just like anyone else. And one of the challenges that we run into with some of our providers is with the old mindset, um, it, it's a very tricky thing of trying to get them to understand, no, if the person isn't saying I'm motivated to go to treatment, they can still be allowed to come into the apartment unit. If the person decides to not engage in some activity that you're more familiar with, that is not a failure. You know, we have been successful just by starting to house them and starting to move along this continuum. Um, I don't know what more I can say. I, I, I think what it's just, I, I, I guess I want to emphasize so much the idea of orientation and training. You know, for people to really change their mindset and think of this as a process, you know, that when we come in, we are beginning a process. That while that person may seem not motivated or engaged through the support of services, and I know when we link people to the HARPS and the health home, we are going to enhance those supported services. Those are opportunities for what I call helpful conversations, engagement opportunities to maybe help that person start having dialogues that they can begin to maybe move along a continuum and start to do better. Henri, I didn't hear you say that um, Housing First is going to replace uh, traditional abstinence 
recovery models. Um, you're suggesting that it's, it's, it's an additional option for folks to expand their repertoire of service. Is that correct? Yes. It has allowed people to expand and to really bring in a population that we have not been serving. I mean, this is a group of folks who have just not been able to come into housing. And earlier you referred to MRT. I uh, just uh, oh, let me start explain, right. explain that a little All bit. Right, yeah. Some people and might not that's know. That's a good that. idea. So the Medicaid redesign, we've heard some of it this morning, is this whole concept of, well, start off with trying to have Medicaid savings. And in the housing arena, the idea is if we house people and connect them with uh, predictable, reliable, preventable health services, we will begin to see savings in the Medicaid arena. Anecdotally, we are seeing this already. We had one of our first provider meetings with the state and you know, had some of the folks talk about some of their experiences. And it was such a wonderful thing to hear of examples where someone coming in and on average was going to the emergency room almost every month and in 11 months have been there once and has begun to stabilize their medical conditions with predictable health care. Um, to have the same individuals who may have been using on a frequent basis to now have that use reduced to where it seems to be something more manageable, not as problematic as it was in the past. But I do want to mention, you know, while this is a wonderful program, we also have to remember it's funded by entities and by nature of funding there are some things we do have to abide by. So while we are not necessarily requiring you to be in treatment, to successfully complete treatment, just have an SUD disorder, you do have to have Medicaid. And in that year prior to the admission, you have to demonstrate being someone who was a high use, high spender of those Medicaid services. And, it, and of course, uh, chronic homelessness. Um, and what we are seeing in this second year, again, it is working. We have now seen reinvestment of some dollars that we think are savings. And what I think, talking about building in, we're talking about expanding. I have providers at this point, even given the challenges, of saying if we could have more housing, we take it on. And, you know, going back to something I said earlier about this harm reduction approach, I think it is very easy for us to pick out, you know, those one or two tenants where it didn't work out. You know, they're drinking and they had to be evicted. What about the 24 that are doing well? What about the 50 that their health care is getting better? You know, they're moving along a continuum and maybe making changes in their lives that they would not have had that opportunity to do that if the MRT was not in place.